What's going on, everybody? Welcome in to episode six of the Deal Spotlight, where we are going to be covering the Schlumberger Champion X oil field service merger. We have not dipped our toes in the OFS waters yet, but I am excited to do that with none other than Jeff Krimmel. He is a, a an energy expert. He has an excellent newsletter I'd recommend checking out. He's the owner of Krimmel Strategy Group formerly of Pinnacle, Key Energy Services, and GE, where he really was at the forefront of a lot of oil field service market strategy stuff. He joins the show today, helps us really get an overview from a 30,000-foot view of what uh, the oil field service market is dealing with from a from kind of a financial and M&A standpoint. And then we dive into and cover everything about this deal, which is really novel for me. Again, being an upstream guy and generally what we cover on the show, this was an awesome overview. I really thank uh, Jeff for coming on here. You should go hit the description below to check out all the ways you can find Jeff. You can visit him on his website. You can also subscribe to his newsletter, The Business of Energy. Highly recommend. It's something I read every Monday. And again, hit that description below. You'll be able to see all of that. Thanks for checking us out. As always on the Deal Spotlight, that description below will also have ways to visit us at Energy News Be Taught and links to all of our previous episodes. But I'm going to go ahead and kick it off and turn it over, and uh, let's learn about this deal. Jeff, welcome into the Deal Spotlight. Appreciate you joining us today. So much for having me. Yeah, no, this this will be fun. You uh, you just recently got back from your first keynote address. Hope all that went well. It went great. Yeah, it was a a, a lot of fun to put together and and deliver. So all's well there. Yeah, no, appreciate it. Well, I'm I'm excited to have you. You know, I I you've been starting to put out a lot more content. First off, you've been putting out some great videos on LinkedIn. You also have a great newsletter, which everybody can check out the description below. We'll definitely have a link to that. I'm definitely a subscriber and some really interesting nuggets in there and and you kind of being the the oil field service expert i was really excited when you were like yeah let's come on and, and talk about this schlumberger champion x deal because you know we were talking about this a little bit before we we started recording here is you know i come from and and, and what we do on this podcast is really focus on the upstream uh merger side we, we've done exxon pioneer we've done yeah uh, oxy crown quest we, we've done the gamut going back to to january now and I was telling you, I I feel like I should be more knowledgeable of what goes into a lot of these oil field service deals and, and coming from the upstream sector. I know that, you know, me and, and definitely a lot of our listeners are are keen to learn a little bit more about kind of what goes on behind the scenes um, from a from from this type of side, specifically on the oil field service side. So I, I'm really excited to dive into this. You know, we'll get to the actual SLB champion X merger here in a second, but I want to you know, start off by just giving, you know, letting you talk for a bit, a little bit about your background, what you've done. You're, you're an oil field services, you know, energy expert. I mean, I don't want to uh, limit you just to oil field services, but that's a lot about what your background is. And I, I think you've, you've got to going to have a really unique perspective on this. So if you just don't mind kind of just, just kicking off and tell us a little bit about kind of your background and, and, and where you ended up where you are today. Certainly. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so my, my education is all in mechanical engineering. I have a bachelor's, a master's, a PhD, all in mechanical engineering. And so I figured, you know, as I was finishing up the PhD, that I was going to have this, you know, long and winding journey through research and development as a career. And that lasted for all of about 15 months. I, I joined Baker Hughes immediately uh, upon uh, defending my PhD thesis and uh, joined in a traditional research and development capacity, uh, working on, on new product design for wireline tools and MWD, LWD tools. And uh, but then very quickly got kicked off into a leadership development program. And uh, and through that program, I found my way into some data driven pricing and profitability work. And that then led into some market intelligence work that I did. So that was, you know, the back, say, six years, five, six years of my time uh, at Baker Hughes was all data driven pricing, profitability, market intelligence, that kind of thing. Um, I left Baker Hughes in the summer of 2018 after the combination with GE Oil and Gas and went to Key Energy Services. And basically there did a, a combination of what I had done at the tail end of my time at Baker Hughes. I had done some uh, pricing work and some market intelligence work. And uh, I was at Key until the pandemic and then went to Pinnacle uh, where I became the chief strategy officer. And Pinnacle is an industrial reliability services uh, company. Mm -hmm. And so their um, customer base is much more on the downstream side, but also in mining, a bit midstream, uh, and so I did a lot of market intelligence work over there, but again, focused sort of outside. There was some upstream work there, but but focused in a lot of adjacent spaces beyond just upstream. So 
over the past 15 years or so, I've I've been kind of eyeballs deep into market intelligence, specifically in oil and gas, but in some adjacent spaces as well. Yeah, again, you can, you know, guys, you can see exactly why we brought him on because he's he's going to be able to help break this down at all. So I, I'm really interested. So when you talk about you were you were doing some like market pricing, is that literally helping? you know, helping service companies actually price their products relative to what an operator would say. I mean, I assume, trust me, that's a, that's a, a not an easy job. Be, oh, Frax, just a hundred grand. Nah, there's a little bit more that goes into it. Exactly right. And, and you know, that's why, I, I mean, all the stuff that I've done, I've, I've found it interesting in different ways. The pricing bit has probably been genuinely the most challenging mm -hmm. uh, part because the, the collaboration that's required to come up with, with an optimal pricing strategy is, is immense because you have, uh, you know, the sales folks that are on the ground that have these relationships that that are aware of, um, you know, the the customer needs specifically. You have the operation side of understanding what we can deliver and and what those realities look like, and then you have the finance folks that are trying to to make sure that we're delivering the financial performance that you would expect. And you have all the competitive pressures, awareness of of you know competitive intelligence and all the rest. So all of that has to kind of blend into uh, what you hope is an optimized. Uh, pricing approach. And like you said, there's just a lot of moving parts. It's a lot of fun. It's it's very rewarding when you get it right. And it's incredibly difficult. So is is does that have a lot to do with kind of forecasting where the market is going to be from an upstream side? Because I think we're going to get into the M&A stuff a little bit in the, in the classic, you know, oh, rig counts going up. So service companies are going to do better. I think we kind of all a little bit know that. What are some of those key variables when you're, you know, kind of put yourself back in your old job? What are some of those key variables that you see that were kind of driving prices one way or the other that, you know, maybe outside of rig count, which I think everybody kind of knows? Right. So you nailed that one. You start sort of at the macro level and, and get a sense, okay, where's activity on the whole going? And, and that's that's a nice sort of baseline to start with. Where you then go is you, you have to really start to understand uh, how differentiated is your product and service offering and what does um, substitution look like around that, right? If, if you're mm -hmm. highly differentiated and you know you can uh, genuine, you generate differential performance for your customers and they have seen this and lived it and you're confident in it, well, that, that leads to one approach around pricing. Uh, if, on the other hand, you're in a, a much more commoditized space where you're playing a utilization game and you're playing an operational efficiency game, uh, that leads to a very different reality around how you want to uh, structure your pricing, deploy your operations. And uh, But both of those are informed, like you said, sort of high level, uh, you know, what, what is activity doing across the oil field? And and you also do some customer segmentation work. So, so you can be differentiated within one segment of customers, but then not differentiated amongst different segments of customers. So mm -hmm. like you said, when you start, say, all in at the rig count level or the activity level, you can look at what it is across the U.S. oil field. You then want to segment that and see if there's a particular class of operators that you know your best position to serve. What is activity looking like within that class mm -hmm. of operators? What are their realities looking like? And again, that's where you have to collaborate and pull in a lot of um, field level intelligence. I, I can do a lot of research from publicly available, you know, market facing information. But then you collaborate with folks that are out there living it, breathing it, sleeping it, eating it every single day and pull everything together. And that's how you build your strategy. Well, I mean, there's a reason Baker Hughes is the one that's been running the rig count numbers for over 20 years now because you guys have or, you know, they have the best data available. So, no, that's super, super interesting. But yeah, uh, it's it. it that's right. It's it's, you know, it, it, and it is part of the culture. Uh, I, I would say at Baker Hughes when I was there that that you know, you you do feel this sense of ownership that, that you're you know supplying the industry with a data set that that needs to be you know that, in, in which folks have a lot of confidence and they're making a lot of business decisions mm -hmm. that are informed by that data set. So it does lead to uh, you know a, a real uh, appreciation for the stakes of the game that's being played and the value of using data in the right ways. And as we talk about the 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 broader kind of oil field service M and A market, you know, it's there, there. There's not as many deals. I mean, there's very few deals to actually look at data points. I think one of the articles I read, there's only been like nine deals since 2015 or something like that. Like it's a small ish data set, at least from kind of what makes out in the public. I'm sure in your realm, you've seen a lot more at the small small level. But the 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 data set maybe necessarily isn't it 
big. When you're looking at just kind of when you when when a deal kind of crosses your plate or somebody says, "Hey, I think that you know you you hear a rumor and you're and you're thinking about evaluating it." What are some of the the key metrics that people should look at kind of off the bat to say, "Oh, interesting. This this company is it a lot to do with forecasting? Is it looking backwards and seeing how efficient they are with kind of the the verticals they're in? What kind of goes into kind of a broader oil field service valuation?" Great question. I, I, I will hate to disappoint you with my top level answer, which is all of the above. Okay. Um, th th there is an all of the above element to it. So, so you can start with how you would analyze, say, any deal. Which um, I'll, I'll, in fact, you know, pull back to my keynote that I gave uh, at the Fluids 2024 conference, where I talked about what I'd done was read through press releases for a lot of the ENP um, uh, consolidation uh, activity. And for oil field services. So for the oil field services ones, I, I went through SLB Champion X. I went through um, uh, Patterson UTI next year. And I went through uh, Innovex mm -hmm. and Drillquip and, and pulled out themes for EMPs and for OFS. On the OFS side, the three themes that showed up in all those press releases and, and really have showed up historically, but, but it's a little bit different now, were scale, innovation, and returns. The returns bit is newish. I mean, obviously, shareholders have always cared about returns, but uh, particularly right now in, in today's oil and gas sector, uh, they they have a visibility that it's even you know, greater than what they'd had historically. So when you're thinking about uh, uh, the oil field services combinations, rumors, these sorts of things, right? I typically go through those three types of themes. Like, there's a scale argument of, like you said, there, yep. there's a bunch of small scale deals that would happen day to day. But what gets really interesting is, are you combining two entities, that each of which have already achieved scale to some degree, and where the combined entity uh, is meaningfully different than, than the two entities that existed before? And that's where SLB Champion X starts to get interesting, because when you start to carve out the production side within the U.S. oil field specifically, uh, that space does look different after this deal than it does before that deal. We can go through those um, uh, details later. So there's no, absolutely. A, an element of, there's an element of scale right, that, that, that you care about when you're thinking about these deals where uh, if, if you're adding meaningful scale, that starts to make a difference. It starts to make the combination uh, more justifiable because with that increased scale comes increased leverage. You have increasing um, you know, commercial optionality. And uh, that's the lifeblood of, of oil field services is keep equipment uh, working and, and uh, try to do it at a pricing level where you can justify you know, maintaining that work over time. So there's a scale element. There's an innovation element, all the technology. You know, we, we've always heard about that on oil field services. And it's it's thought of as being the technology epicenter for, for oil and gas in a lot of ways. And um, that gets really interesting when you think about combinations of who's bringing what technology and what sort of cultures exist around technology mm -hmm. innovation in these oil field services shops. All oil field services companies talk about innovation, uh, but they live it out and invest in it in very different ways. So, so you can start to think through, okay, is there a real uh, alignment in, in how these different cultures are, are pursuing mm. innovation that would make a combined entity uh, more potent than either of the entities are uh, by themselves? And then there's a returns element. You know, if, 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 there's, if, if both are, are generating healthy cash flow levels and you find a way to unlock even more going forward, great. Um, if one or both are struggling, does the combination allow them to, you know, the word of the day with all this is synergies, to identify some of these synergies and harvest them uh, so that shareholders can get more out of the combined entity than they would out of uh, the two uh, when they were separate beforehand? So these are all elements you start to work through when you ask yourself, can a deal be justified? But is there a reason that we're, we see less overall kind of deals make it this far in the in the OFS space relative to the EMP is there are there challenges as you know oil field service providers look to merge I mean you would think maybe you know if the were if scale like you said is something that's key you know it, it may be who Slumberger they should be buying everybody right now yes it's it's a great question there's the there's a challenge on the oil field services side. Like I said, the, the, the notion of integrating oil field services companies, and this is me painting with a very broad brush, so, so the disclaimers uh, apply, but integrating uh, oil field services companies, uh, it's a very different proposition than, say, integrating on the ENP side. Not mm -hmm. that integrating any two entities of scale is ever easy. It's not. There are always real challenges to be done there. But like I mentioned about uh, the technology side uh, on the OFS side, you also have differences in... Um, operational paradigms, safety programs, cultures, um, you know, legacy customer relationships. And uh, I think that, that the oil field services segment has found over time, and like we found in, in uh, the economy broadly, when you, you know, look at some of these studies about uh, the returns to business combinations, 
in general, they don't work right over the half the time. Mm -hmm. you, you, you generate less value than you would have if you kept the two apart. And so there's some hubris that goes into thinking, ah, of course, we can just combine these two entities and, and get something more valuable on the back end, right? You have to think very uh, deeply around what are the nuances of actually integrating these things. I think that's the challenge mostly on the oil field services side is mm -hmm. it's, it's easy for any one company to think like we're we're almost there. Like we just got this just a little bit more and we're going to unlock, you know, that next level of performance and that next uh, increment of value uh, that why go through all the disruption of trying to combine with someone and, and making that happen when you've seen in oil field services, there's a bunch of, of those acquisitions that don't really change the game. And so I think there's a culture, I think there's a sentiment, I think there's just sort of a, a general friction around believing that, that those sorts of combinations uh, will will be as uh, effective as as we have seen on the EMP side of things. You know, kind of the last two deals that have happened in the OFS space, we're about to write, we're, we're about to talk about, you know, Slumberjay Champion X here, but you mentioned UTI, um, Patterson, and um, Next Year Oil. You know, the difference between those two deals, there's a lot, but one of them being one of them's a merger, and the other one is we're buying you and controlling it. Is there, is, is there a, 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 is, I assume the challenges are with the merger tend to a lot more with what you're talking about synergies, who's going to do what overlapping business units. Whereas the, the, the issues that could arise say in a acquisition have maybe more to do with the expected returns aren't exactly what the acquirer was expecting. Is that kind of how you, how you see it? I think that's a great way to, to say it. Yes. There's just more uncertainty when you're, when you're talking a merger of equals and, you just necessarily when you're talking to merger of equals, they typically are, are entities that are much smaller in scale, say, than, than SLB is. And SLB has, you know, an acquisition playbook, right? They've done this routinely yep. countless times. And so they know exactly what they're doing and how to do it and why to do it. It doesn't mean it's going to work flawlessly, but it does mean they, they have an approach. Like there's not an uncertainty around how are we going to integrate this acquired company into our operations? They know exactly how that works. When you take two equals that are trying to merge in that way, there's a lot more uncertainty in the integration process. And in general, when you're talking about mergers of equals, you're talking about, about two companies that, um, you know, desperation is too strong of a word, but, but that see that, hey, the, the returns to getting bigger, the, the returns to combining, um, joining forces here are so much greater than what we'd be staring at if we continue to march on this thing alone. And so, I, like I said, desperation is too strong of a word, but there's a lot of motivation to, to realize like, hey, there's... There's immense struggle in front of us or potential struggle if we stay alone, but let's combine, find someone of a similar size combine. And so what that means is just the starting point of that integration is slightly more turbulent than, than what you would see if you're a massive you know, SLB whose financial performance is going very smoothly at the moment. And this is one additional way to, to unlock incremental value going forward. So I think there's, there are important differences between those two types of combinations. No, I, I completely agree. And final question kind of before we dive into to this deal specifically here, kind of for me and the audience, can you kind of set the stage of the current kind of sentiment of the oil field services right now? I mean, we have oil prices have pretty much rose over the past six months, but we haven't seen that reflected, at least in the overall rig count. I know some of that activity is continuing to go on, but gas prices are also low. So you've got companies like Chesapeake, you know, drilling but not completing any of these wells we're building up that duck count again give us a quick kind of thirty thousand foot overview of kind of where the the ofs field sits right now and so we can kind of use that as a backdrop to what we were about to talk about in this deal that question aligns very well with the theme of the keynote uh, that i gave at the fluids 2024 conference and what that was is that on the enp side um EMPs are generating much more cash from operations than they had even going into the pandemic there was a big climb coming out of the pandemic. It has fallen off since then as oil prices have come back down, but still they're generating more cash over uh, $20 per BOE um, uh, across the cohort of the um, EMP side. And so with that extra cash that they're generating, like you said, it, that cash is not going to standing up more rigs. Like the, the rig count in the US is, is flat at the moment. It's down from where it was a year ago. Uh, I showed a chart on the international side, rig count, it continues to grow but the pace at which it is growing is slowing down. So you are mm -hmm. reaching toward a plateau, even on the international rig count. So where is all this extra capital going? The theme of the keynote was a ton of it's going to shareholders. It's going to shareholders in the form of increased dividends, increased share repurchases. I showed a couple of charts that shows as oil prices go up, cash from operations for EMPs goes up, and then cash transfers to shareholders goes up. So we're not seeing it on the uh, rig count side. So like you said, that is a headwind against oil field services that, that we're not seeing just uh, a huge wave of new activity 
uh, that's made available to uh, oil field services. What we have seen, uh, again, coming out of the pandemic, past couple of years, the oil prices have gone up. We've seen margins expand uh, on the OFS side. We've seen returns on capital expand on the OFS side. Uh, oil field services is healthier today than it's been in years, frankly. Um, you know, certainly since coming out of the price crash 2014, 2016. So uh, I, I made a, a couple of posts on LinkedIn where, uh, and I know it's, it sounds uh, weird for me to say, that's part of the reason I, I try to say it out loud, is, you know, the past year, two years-ish in that time frame, this has been the golden age for oil field services. I know it, there's, it, whenever you live through a golden age, there's always reasons that it's, ah, it's not that great, or ah, it's still frustrating. And, and I get it. I'm not trying to argue it's perfect. That's not what the golden age means. Um, but having been, you know, around uh, the oil field services space as long as I have, you, you can see it in a lot of different um, uh, market phases. And uh, this phase has been phenomenal. So, like, if, if you think oil field services are struggling or disadvantaged right now, right, you haven't seen anything compared to to what they've lived historically. And uh, you know, some other cycle is probably coming in the not too distant future. So, now uh, what I've also done uh, for the oil field services side is gone back and looked at price to earnings ratios. Uh, very simple metric, right? But it is something I do pay attention to because I am curious to see how uh, how much are investors really willing to pay for for these dollars of oil food services earnings. And what we saw is as earnings have have grown coming out of the pandemic, um, you know, PE ratios had, had started sky high because earnings were so thin, right? So, and investors expected, hey, this segment is going to generate earnings in the future. So, no, we're not really buying the the earnings that have been reported at this point, but we expect it to be uh, to, to generate healthy earnings going forward. So as these earnings levels have started to equilibrate, you, know, you have, say, in the range of 13 to 17 uh, for the big oil field services companies. And it actually reached a low in January, February. And it's now starting to climb a little bit again. Now, some of that is, you know, the, the earnings side, it's starting to walk back just a little. But some of it is, I think we're starting to see that the oil field services landscape, uh, a lot of these companies have responded very well to the recovery to the pandemic. Uh, while there are pockets of, of uh, overbuild where there's excess supply out there, um, it's not widespread across the whole OFS space. So these margins that we recovered to coming out of the pandemic are largely holding. These returns levels are largely holding. Um, you know, we're not seeing this big crash. We didn't see a race on the OFS side to try to capture every last increment of, of activity. And this wager that, hey, there's even more activity coming on the back end. The ENPs have been disciplined about it. The OFS side has been disciplined. Uh, and so they're in a, a reasonably good spot at the moment. No, that's, I think it's a great overview uh, of where kind of the market stands. So I, let's pivot here and let's actually kind of talk specifically about Schlumberger Champion X. So um, for everybody listening there, um, it, we're, we're going to, I'm going to probably pop up a few slides um, during this. So I'll do my best to make sure I'm covering it. But this deal happened April uh, 2nd, 2024, probably been in the works for, for a little bit, which is a, an interesting question I've got for you coming there. But we'll go ahead. And if you're following along at home, we're going to pull up slide four here of the announcement deck. It just basically got kind of their five key bullet points. And I think what's, what's, you know, what serves a lot of light, Jeff, to what you said is the three things you mentioned of what drive uh, m a activity in the oil reserves was mentioned in these announced and highlights. First, it, it's, you know, their, their first thing was they're saying they're strengthening their their production space, um, which basically gets them into a, a new market segment that they're not necessarily in. It ended up being about a $7.7 billion dollar total price deal, which basically was done in all stock, which is another question I've got for you because now has never been a better time in the energy industry to use your stock to go acquire. Um, used to have to be all cash for a lot of this stuff. So super interesting. But that $7.7 billion price tag, um, including the debt, which I think brought it up to a little bit above $8, uh, $8 billion, uh, represents about a 91, nine per, or 91% 9% split between SLB now and Champion X. It's about a uh, 0.735 share conversion. Um, based on that, those shares of Champion X were valued at about $40.59, which represents about a 14.7% premium. Again, kind of their their highlights, as you see in the bottom here, you know, it, it, it slumbers is really touting the fact that it's kind of bringing them into a new market, specifically this production chemical space, which Champion uh, Champion X, pun intended, has championed 
Um, number two, um, again, the, the kind of they got they they're talking about their combined portfolio. They 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 go there right there and highlight the uh, the the shares, um, which I already mentioned. And then kind of the last two points, Jeff, that you mentioned specifically is is they're touting the synergies of about four hundred million dollars, which they'll be able to annualize on a on a three year basis or be able to achieve that within three years is is what that kind of PR sp- is what that means from a from a PR. Sp- I wrote a lot of these uh, uh, sell side and buy side papers, so I love breaking down and figuring out which side of the fence wrote this because sometimes it can be obvious. And then specifically that number five, um, increasing their total returns to shareholders um, to a target of $3 billion this year where they really feel like they're going to see the returns uh, increase based upon this deal is in 2025 at uh, four billion, you know, off the top, I just kind of want to let you go. You know, what did you think initially about this deal? And then we'll kind of break down some of the stuff that they were. You know, I always love to read the transcripts of these mergers and figure out what were, what's driving it. Then go back and look at their last quarterly earnings report to see if their mood has switched a little bit. It's a fantastic question, Michael. And and I would say when I first heard the deal, I do the same thing you do: read through the press releases. Uh, I made a, a big point in the keynote that. Um, you know, like I said, some of the stuff that I talked about was reading the press releases of, of a bunch of EMP deals and then some of these oil field services deals. And these press releases, right, are, it's, it's easy to kind of have your eyes glaze and just skim through it and be like, okay, I got it. Um, these press releases are incredibly deliberately constructed. Uh, I, I made a point to say, you know, the word choice matters, uh, the structure of the press release matters. And uh, I made the point that omissions from the press release matter. If you pay attention to what's not in some of these releases, uh, you can start to get some information. So uh, it, when I read through the press release, and I do the same thing you do. I then go back to say previous um, earnings calls and read through some of those transcripts and just get a sense of uh, you know what what did the landscape look like leading into this kind of deal. This is clearly Schlumberger uh, positioning itself to participate much more meaningfully on the production side of the U.S. oil field, and that makes a lot of sense for a bunch of different reasons. They talked about in the press release how um, you know how much of a well's life cycle. Uh, lives in this production phase of things. And so there is um, a long runway of potential cash flows available to service companies that can support ENPs on the production side. And particularly in the U.S. oil field, where we, like I said, we've seen activity levels in terms of rig count uh, be flat now for some period of time. We're still down where we were relative to a year ago. Uh, If if you're not going to have, you know, so much uh, incremental well construction activity uh, to participate in, you really want access to the ongoing uh, production streams. That's also representative of what we've heard through these EMP consolidation announcements is that, um, you know, the, you probably remember, say, circa 10 years ago, where these sexy initial production records would get celebrated widely and, and investors would respond to them. And that's not nearly the case so much anymore. And uh, in my notes, I highlighted uh, in SLB's uh, press release, they said that, you know, like we acknowledge our customers uh, are, are uh, trying to maximize their assets, I believe was their phrase. And we're now in a phase where, uh, Investors, EMP management teams, OFS management teams are increasingly realizing we will trade away these short-term, sexy initial production records, say, uh, in order to get a long runway of sustainable cash flows on the back end. And uh, so it made a lot of sense to me knowing that how massive the U.S. oil field is um, and uh, how SLB, how weakly SLB was positioned before this kind of deal and participating on the production side of it. Uh, this combination makes a lot of sense from that perspective. I think that's because the next kind of slide they talk about, I want to pull this graph up here. It's they, they specifically talk about what you were, you mentioned that upstream EMP market spend where right now, you know, in 2010, about $6 out of every $10 spent was going into CapEx versus OpEx. Today, as it stands, it's about $5.40 relative to that $10 spend. And the projection going to 2040 is that only 45% or $4.50 of every $10 is going into CapEx and 55% or that $5 range is going into OPEX. First off, do is is that what you see happening? Because that's a lot of what this deal hinges on, going to what Champion X is, is you know, we'll, we'll talk about it in a bit there. Huge, their segment is OPEX. They 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 are mainly focused, not necessarily, you know, they're not, they don't necessarily have a hydraulic, a hydraulic fracturing um, business line. They're mainly focused um, on that other stuff. So is is that a correct assumption? I That seemed to me kind of one of the big things underpinning this, this the thesis of this merger was the fact that the, the shift of spend is really going to go towards OPEX versus CAPEX. Do you buy that? Directionally, I do. Yes. It, you know, on the, on the CAPEX side, the well construction side, 
you have a lot of technology efficiencies that, that are continuing to work against that, that, that uh, on a spend intensity basis will try to drive um, you know, aggregate spend levels down in that phase. Whereas on the production side, those barrels are going to come to surface and they will yep. come to surface over uh, you know, a period of years, decades. Uh, and so that's going to require ongoing activity to make sure that those production flows uh, are efficient and safe and, and captured and steered, directed the way you want them to. Uh, so it does make a lot of sense going forward as the U.S. oil field continues to mature uh, that you would see that spend pendulum swing. And I like the way they do it. It's, it's not you know a super dramatic. It's not an 80 20 kind of deal, but but it does start to drift more toward the production side of, of the life cycle. And so if you're not there today uh, or if you're not there at the scale that you want to be today, it would make sense to pull the kind of lever that SLB pulled. Yeah, no, I think I, I, I think, yeah, because as, as you said, a lot of this. Uh... A lot of this deal is 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 focused around that. I think the next you know the next slide uh, slide six here. I really just want to show kind of the revenue by segment for fiscal twenty twenty three for Champion X. Over sixty four percent of their revenue came from production chemicals technology. Only six of it came from drilling technologies. The rest of you know the rest of it between their chemicals and then their automation business. So you're talking over ninety percent of their revenue is really in a business unit that Schlumberger hasn't necessarily attacked. I would say as maybe they hard as maybe they should have considering their international, you know, kind of their, their, their big stance on, on kind of the, the frack and wireline side. That's right. It's, you know, and I, I think this is also SLB acknowledging that uh, in today's oil field, time is of the essence, right? There's some of this stuff that's always been true. So uh, time is of the essence is a phrase that any management team in history would respond positively to, right? So, so it's not that that, that idea is, is unique today. What, what is unique today, though, um, is the, uh, the extent to which investors are demanding a premium to participate in oil and gas specifically, say, mm -hmm. whether it's on the ENP side or the oil field services side. And this premium is coming largely through uh, increased dividends and increased activity around share repurchases. And so you, when you know time is of the essence and that investors don't just expect these synergies to materialize and increased cash transfers at some point in the future, but it needs to happen almost immediately, which is a word that I highlighted in a lot of the ENP uh, press releases. They talk about uh, you know, the, the, the word of choice there is accretion and how th these deals are accretive to all financial metrics. Uh, and many of them say are immediately accretive to all financial metrics. Uh, and for those that didn't use the word immediately, talked about would be a, a, a accretive within one year of, of the deal finishing. I, I go on that little bit of a tangent to highlight SLB has effectively all the resources any oil field services company could hope to have, right? If, if it got serious about it, it could have said, hey, I want to stand up a production chemicals business inside this thing. We can go hire whoever we need to hire. We can uh, invest in however we need to invest, mm -hmm. so on and so forth, and build out this business. Uh, I believe it is kudos to them realizing that, or we could do that path, or we could find a business that plays at scale in that way today and acquire it, integrate it, stand it up, and those gains we can capture immediately. Yes, we will pay a premium for buying a business that already exists, that already has those customer relationships, that's already achieved what it's going to achieve. It could have, quote, unquote, have been cheaper to try to do this internally. Uh, I, I think it's it's easy to overestimate how easy it would be to stand up new businesses inside of these OFS behemoths. And that's why I'm not surprised. That's why I continue to, to believe that we're going to see more consolidation mm -hmm. on the OFS side as they realize that, hey, if if we're not playing where we want to play today, yes, we could follow a, a long R&D game around that, or we could acquire someone like Champion X and make this happen almost immediately. So that 14.5% premium that 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 Schlumberger paid, do you, you, you know, is, is that large, small? Where's that relative to where maybe you would have pegged this, where other people are pegged this, or what you might have seen in, in previous kind of deals? My initial reaction, I should be clear that, you know, I've, I've not done, say, a, a thorough survey across the M&A landscape. My initial reaction was that that, that premium was relatively light, uh, mm -hmm. given, and I say that because uh, Champion X is, uh, it performs very strongly. Its financial metrics are, are strong. It, it has um, the right kinds of customer relationships in the right kinds of places. And uh, it just showed me uh, how, um, you know, how weak the sentiment is around OFS generally, that, that you could, you know, for 14%, gobble up uh, an entity of the quality of Champion X mm -hmm. and that SLB would be the one to be able to, to do that so quickly. Uh, so if anything, mildly surprising that it's sort of on the lighter end, because again, compared to trying to stand something like that up organically, internally, uh, this this is 
such a more direct path to try to get to that kind of outcome. Yeah, and I love going back to what you originally said. I love the word accretive too. You can just throw it anywhere, and it sounds great. Um, we on if you're looking at the the the, the press release slide nine. They've got accretive in two of their three bullet points. You've got accretive to cash, free cash flow, and margin accretive, which I absolutely love. And it kind of flows into my next question, which is, you know, in that's one of the things that they're touting is the 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 business lines that that Champion X is in. If you go back and look at the their fourth quarter earnings report, you know one of their big their key performance metrics is EBITDA margin, amount of uh, and and margin specifically in their individual business units is is the chemical side or kind of the opex side of the spend a little bit more you know to use the word of the uh, of the uh, the investor relations folks margin accretive or is it very much so that it just it, it is a little bit more dependent on some of the macro environments is that and, and i guess what that means is is can you can Schlumberger expect these quote unquote good margins to continue you know even to 2040 Right. I, so yes, there's always um, uncertainty around a lot of this, but but again, directionally, yes, I would believe that the the production chemical side you could expect to be um, if you start to line up products and services lines against uh, each other, uh, this production chemicals line you could expect to be uh, to have stronger margins than than uh, the others on balance going forward. It's just it's the nature of the technology, it's the nature of um, the the delivery systems, the um, you know the, the kind of scale that's necessary to meet the commitments. Uh, for the largest customers in those segments, yes, there are mom and pop chemicals companies, just like there's mom and pop uh, flavors of every you know oil food service variation that you can find. So it's not that those don't exist, but uh, particularly on the chemical side, there's real returns to having uh, the technology and the scale mm -hmm. and the delivery apparatus that that Champion X or now SLB has around that. So so I would feel confident that that you know this won't become um, a margin anchor anytime soon if you invest in it the right way and continue to. Uh, evolve it in the right way. It should be a strong contributor to SLB's portfolio. The, the one of the, the 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 things they also mention is is the combined synergies. And I know everybody hears that and immediately thinks layoffs because that's what we've been come to know. Is that really where they feel the synergies come in, or I guess talk a little bit about where where some of this? Is that just slash? I mean, they mentioned GNA. Obviously, there is a little bit of GNA overlap, but you know, when I hear synergies, I automatically think, well, we got you know, we're going to see a lot of resumes flying around now. So you're right. There's always an element of that. There's always going to be uh, overlap, duplication that that gets pulled out of this. I think though, there's also um, you know just efficiencies that you can capture by Champion X now having access to all of the infrastructure that that SLB already has. Whether again, it's operational infrastructure, del you know, delivery, logistics, all the rest. Whether it's uh, research development um, resources that are made available, where Champion X, you know, just it, it would have cost them more to pursue some of the gains to make some of the investments that SLB can is either already making or can make more cheaply than, than Champion X can. So that's another uh, mechanism where you can find synergies. And depending on how the synergies are defined, you know, there's the cost side specifically, but there's also revenue synergies. And um, you know, between SLB and Champion X, you'll have uh, stronger, you know, more involved uh, customer relationships than either one would find individually. And, and those customer relationships might allow you to uh, achieve some some commercial flexibility that you otherwise wouldn't, so so maybe they can you know uh, do some more performance pricing that gives them access to more upside going forward when they're more efficient or when um, you know the macro winds are blowing favorably, uh, they're able to to capture a little bit more of that rather than ceding all of it over to the EMPs. So there's a lot of ways to capture uh, synergies. So yes, the duplication element is one bit; it will always be there, but there are plenty of other ways to to go after that as well. No, I think it's super interesting. In, in in terms of the amount of debt that specifically Champion X is holding, I mean, it was only about a about a, about a half X, you know, leverage. That seems that that seemed at least on the EMP side a little, you know, not low, but it, it definitely seems to be a little bit um, more conservative than I think I would have expected. In the EMP side, do you see is Oilfield Service a little bit, you know, lighter on the debt side, and the, and and a lot of things are more funded that way, or, or how, how does that play into this? Because I was a little shocked. I was like, wow, it's you know, almost no debt on this company. Excellent question. And I think it ties back to, you had mentioned uh, the all stock nature of the transaction and those are tied. And that's another theme. You know, I, I, I apologize for keep referring back to the uh, keynote, but my I was eyeballs deep in prep for that. And, and this was one theme that, that showed up over and over again is that across the oil field, both ENP and uh, OFS side, but also midstream, downstream, so on and so forth. There's um, There's been enormous pressure to uh, main, at least maintain, if not strengthen, balance sheets. We mm -hmm. saw the the catastrophe that was the 2014 to 2016 price crash and and what 
um, over leveraged balanced sheets looked like when you're trying to survive an oil price crash like that, right? It was just um, beyond nasty. And so uh, there's, a, there's been a lot of effort put into strengthening balance sheets. And in these deals, both on the EMP side and the OFS side, you're seeing increasingly um, high stock weightings on these transactions. Many of them are all stock transactions. Those that do uh, have some cash involved, the cash is relatively light. And the big reason for that is you don't want to have to dip into more debt to uh, execute these kinds of deals. And the reason you don't want to do that, there's the sort of the general that, you know, just the more levered you are, the more exposed you are in a highly volatile uh, industrial segment like oil and gas, that's always dangerous to take on leverage. The others is it gets back to the shareholders being so laser focused on immediate returns that the higher quality balance sheet you have, which all else equal means less debt, but the higher quality, the more, the stronger the balance sheet that you have, the lower your cost of capital, right? The, the, the less you have to pay to take on the debt, the less you have to, tay, to pay to maintain the debt you have or to pay off the debt you have. And shareholders, equity holders, really want to make sure that any excess capital, any excess cash is coming back to them. So as an oil food services management team, they don't want you paying a penny more than you have to to service or retire the debt that you have. So when you're executing these deals, if you can do it on an all stock basis, you're not having to dip into more debt to come up with the cash that you need to, to close these kinds of deals. Mm -hmm. You're keeping your balance sheet strong and you're making sure that when cash from operations inflex upward, more of that cash is available to hand over to shareholders. So I think it's a, it's a deliberate uh, act here from all these management teams to know that, that leverage is always risky. It's even more risky in today's oil field uh, than it has been in, in recent past. And so a lot of management teams are staying away from it. Yeah, I mean, we've seen even in the, as you mentioned, the upstream side, everything, everyone's now throwing their stock around in these deals, which I think is a sign that people are at least a little bit more bullish on where things are going. You know, as we, as we think about this more broadly, I guess, is, is in the upstream space, the, the theme has been consolidate, 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 because, you know, we're running out of tier one acreage and the only way to get advantage of the tier two acreage is to, is, is to scale up and, and, and do all the stuff. We don't need to focus on that too much, but is from an OFS side, does consolidation hurt the overall outlook of the business? You know, I look at it from, you know, if, if, if I had a, an oil and gas technology company, who of my companies merge, well, I know they're going to come to me in six months and ask for a, Discount. I'm not getting 200% revenue. I may only get 100%, 150%. So do, does, do, is the oil field service seeing a little bit of that as consolidation happens? They're getting, you know, their customers reaching out to them and saying, great, you were, you were a, you, you were a vendor to both of us. Now we're one company. We're, we're not raising prices another hundred percent. It's only 75%. Or is it a little bit detached from that? Cause it's a, that's not necessarily how things are priced. I think you're right, Michael, that there's there's real commercial leverage implications uh, on both sides of consolidations, right? When the EMP is consolidating, it's not so much thinking about, okay, you know, does greater scale allow us to get be better, um, you know, oil field services rates going forward? I mean, there's a little bit of that, but, but that's, mm -hmm. like you said, not the thesis of, of the combination. On the OFS side, it, it, it very much can become existential when, when two customers or one customer combines with an entity that's not a customer. Uh, what does that mean for us on the OFS side? Mm. And so, like I mentioned earlier, when we had the, the conversation about uh, thematically what I'm seeing across these OFS deals, and we're seeing uh, comments around scale, innovation, and returns. On the EMP side, like I said, we don't have to go super deep into that, but there is one bit of the consolidation um, uh, verbiage that I paid a lot of attention to, and that was around the notion of break-evens. They, they talked about uh, in many combinations, they will mention, hey, we got you know this many pro forma locations, say at less than $40 WTI break even. And they know that in order to ramp up uh, cash flow from operations, uh, two things, right? You can wait for oil prices to go up or you can drive your break even uh, price estimates down. And uh, OFS companies, of course, are paying attention to all this and are aware that, okay, EMPs are focused um, you know, sensitively around this idea of how do we drive break evens down as low as possible? On the OFS side, that's largely why you get to all this commentary around innovation. That it's just incredibly important for you know to find new, more efficient, more effective ways uh, to you know construct wells, to um, you know surface the hydrocarbons that, that that are below the ground today, and uh, that largely comes through technology. Yes, there's some operational efficiencies that you can uh, continue to harvest just just through being more uh, effective in, in your logistics, but but technology plays uh, an incredibly important role there, and it has historically for OFS. But it's, again, even more urgent today than it has been. So I think when OFS companies are thinking about uh, combinations, they're also thinking about, and, and, and SLB wrote about it in its press release with Champion X about, um, in fact, I have in my notes here, they said, 
the quote was growing demand to scale emerging technologies such as AI and autonomous operations across global operations. And again, it's easy to read that and be like, okay, I get it. It's you know, the, the, it's the kind of thing that I would expect you know any technology company to, to say. The real importance of them saying it that way is you know we're in an increasingly capital constrained sector, OFS, where, where there's not just uh, you know waves of capital being made available to these companies that they can turn around and just invest willy nilly in all sorts of exotic research and development programs. Shareholders really want access to as much cash as possible. So mm -hmm. you need entities of massive scale like SLB to be able to place these technology bets knowing not all these bets uh, pay off. That's the nature of R&D. Some of it is not going to work the way that you want it to work. But you need entities at scale that can simultaneously place high consequence R&D bets and return a lot of capital to shareholders. And that's why I think we're going to see even more of these kinds of combinations is finding ways to get both access to both pathways, uh, which largely comes through scale. I love a good just throw AI into the press release. You got to do what you got to do. I'm uh, I I love it. What what else about this deal do you like dislike that that we missed on? Because I you know I, I we can sit here and look at a cursory view, but I'm interested in, as you ran this. What is something that you felt that was interesting? What what's maybe a, a little nugget that you saw that 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 you know maybe other people who don't cover this space like me as as much as you do um, noticed and, and and think it's worthy getting out there. I would say the, the two bits that, that I've covered uh, are the ones that, that hit me the hardest. The first was the, the access to the production phase of uh, the U.S. oil field, that, that we know that that phase is, is going to be long. It's going to be consequential. Um, it's, it's meaningfully different than you know, the first 10 to 15 years of the U.S. unconventional oil field, where um, well construction was the name of the game. It was all about you know, how to drill, where to drill, how far can we push these laterals, um, you know, what should optimal well spacing look like? What should uh, these frack designs look like? And, and, and it makes sense. And all that stuff will continue to be incredibly important going forward. Um, but that, that was getting uh, more uh, attention than the production side of the equation. And, and now it's starting to tip where, where the production side is, is becoming even more higher consequence than, than, than we had seen before. And the, the production side is where we're going to get access again to this long, sustainable uh, road of, of cash flows that investors demand uh, to make these companies investable. So this, I think, we, you know, say fast forward five to 10 years in the future, we'll be able to look back and it's possible you can point to the SLB Champion X press release and be like, that's when, um, you know, the, the, that was the most consequential uh, indication that this pendulum was really swinging back toward uh, the production side. The other bit, and again, it's, it, it's easy to think of it as a throwaway line in the press release, but it is something that I paid a lot of attention to, is that SLB, the, their quote was, our customers are seeking to maximize their assets. And I bolded to maximize their assets when I uh, read it, because that's, again, it's a pivot from what we had seen through the first 10 to 15 years of the U.S. unconventional oil field, when it was much more about, um, you know, how big can these wells get? How aggressive can we ramp up our production profiles? How prolific are some of these plays going to be? And this is SLP acknowledging that that, that phase of the game is over, right? We're, we're now at a point where um, these EMP management teams are entrusted with assets and investors are trying to make sure and those management teams are harvesting absolutely as much value out of those assets as possible. And that's a highly complex, highly multidimensional, long-term challenge to resolve. And uh, SLB acknowledges it. They're, they're very clear about this part of the justification for uh, this combination here with, with Champion X. And so uh, at the end of the speech that I gave um, earlier this week, I highlighted that, hey, there's a lot of uncertainty, obviously, around oil and gas for, for all the reasons that we're aware of. And while uncertainty can bring fear naturally, it's how human beings tend to respond to it, um, it, it's also possible for us to lean into the excitement around a lot of this. So when I read the press release for SLB Champion X, I found myself getting very excited about uh, there is a new generation of oil field services company that's going to emerge from all this turbulence and, and, and from the broader energy transition conversation that's happening right now. And I'm incredibly excited about it. I get the impression from reading the SLB uh, press release that, that management there is incredibly excited about it. I think as time goes on, we're going to see that excitement build. We're going to see momentum build around uh, all kinds of technologies that OFS uh, 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 companies can bring to bear on these problems that EMPs absolutely have to resolve. Uh, and so I'm just deeply excited and optimistic about what's in front of us. Yeah. Another thing I found interesting to kind of wrap up this, this, this Schlumberger Champion X deal is, you know, Champion X recently if, is, is in three months ago, had did Simone their own M and A activity themselves, gobbling up a few smaller providers. I assume this deal, you know, having been 
not having worked on large deals like this, but worked on a lot of small mergers. You know, these things take months and months to to, to go through. Do you think that there was uh, some foresight by the Champion X team to say, hey, we may need to strengthen some business units uh, in order to make this deal, you know, look better? Is that something that maybe was hint hint at coming from, from Schlumberger? Because I found that very interesting that, you know, you're in the process of acquiring two companies and all of a sudden you go to sell yourself. It's a great question. I don't know about any direct connection, say, with that activity to the ultimate SLB deal. But what I will say is for uh, a lot of these oil field services companies today, I would imagine they're thinking very deeply about what what do we need to do to position ourselves to either uh, combine and and you know find a, a partner where we can achieve even more scale than we have now, or organically build up the scale that we need to to thrive in this newly emerging oil field. So it doesn't surprise me that that they were already thinking through, okay, our portfolio as it exists right now, where are some key weaknesses that we can go fill so that either we can play the game even stronger going forward, or if there is someone that sees what we're doing and decides this is a fit for them, um, we're able to address some of the uh, caveats or objections or potential frustrations that they might feel as they try to gobble up. Uh, you know, an entity of the scale of, of Champion X. So it's not surprising to see. And in fact, I would expect a lot of management teams are thinking similarly right now. Interesting. So, um, you know, I, I always like to wrap this up and, you know, we I, I like to say we're evaluating the deal here. So what's your opinion? You like the deal? You don't like the deal? We a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Or a thumbs down? Thumbs up. Thumbs up? Thumbs up. Awesome. Well, well, Jeff, I really appreciate it. Um, this has been really enlightening to me. I, I hope everybody um, who listens to this goes and, ch- and check you out. We'll have the link to your uh, you know, your newsletter, your LinkedIn, ways to get a hold of you at, at, in the description. So please go check that out. Really appreciate your time coming here and educate us. And uh, you know, hopefully we can have you back for, for another deal here. Michael, it was an absolute blast. I really appreciate you inviting me on. And yeah, I can't wait for the next time. Absolutely. So, all right, guys, thanks for checking us out here at the Deal Spotlight and the Energy Newsbeat podcast. Until the next one.